from Georgia State University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm myself, Prakash. Uh, I have an amazing team here. Uh, on the left top, that's me. On the right top, Zara. Uh, the left bottom is uh, Sarwan, and we have amazing advisor. Dr. Murray Patterson on the right most corner. So that's, this is our team and I'm presenting a paper on empowering uh, pandemic response with federative learning for protein sequence data analysis. So to begin with the presentation, uh, this is the content that I'm gonna cover today. So we discuss about the introduction, we talk about the motivation behind the problem and the methodology that we have adapted then we'll talk about architecture, workflow, and data set that we have used, and what all baseline models that we have compared in our work. Uh, then we'll talk about the results and conclude the presentation. So to start with introduction, the sequence data analysis is a very important uh, field of study because we have to study the alteration in the protein sequence um, to classify and predict the host and um, there are some other lineages, so uh, there are amino acid changes which is quite frequently happening uh, in the genomic data. To understand the immune invasion, the host to host transmission, there are many applications such, such applications which are uh, important to study and that's why the sequence data analysis is very important. Uh, the applications include vaccine de uh, uh, design and making it efficient. Uh, along with uh, some policy making decisions that can be taken uh, with well informed and uh, well classified or studied analysis on sequence data. Uh, so to start with sequence data analysis, the beginning was with the phylogenetic tree. That was the traditional approach. Uh, the phylogenetic trees uh, were made for genomic sequencing and studying it. But the scalability issue causes it uh, not to be a preferred method to go for it. Uh, later, the deep learning and machine learning um, methods were evolved, which played a major crucial role. But there were few challenges involved with the machine learning and deep learning models as well. So uh, if you see, uh, there are many methods like in the related work section we have mentioned that uh, the KMR based approach such as uh, uh, kernel based approach as well also being used for spike sequence classification. Uh, there were several deep learning uh, state of the art approaches also uh, being proposed and extensive work has been done on image, medical image data. Uh, but the problem is these are all centralized based approach and there is no data privacy and as you can see like the deep neural network um, are always like very time consuming so you can spend ages uh, to just train and uh, tune the model so that's why we have come up with a solution which is uh, using the paradigm from the federated learning and uh, rather than centralized processing um, our approach is to decentralize the process uh, and uh, uh, so the major advantage that we get out of it is like it's a computational benefit that we don't have to centralize the uh, data. So we are having and saving a lot of computational efforts and uh, latency issues as well. Uh, the most important thing that we are motivated was data privacy. So since we are not transmitting any data to the centralized server, we can have the privacy uh, and I'll talk about it more in motivation. Uh, so the passive participation of countries uh, during the COVID-19 was the main motivation behind this work. When we, uh, if we remember all, uh, whatever new variants and new ways were coming, uh, countries were not very encouraged to share their data. Uh, for an example, the South African variant when it arrives, uh, instead of getting rewarded, uh, the whole world has penalized the countries for revealing their information. So there is no motivation for the governments and healthcare systems and uh, like countries to reveal their true legit data rather than uh, getting rewarded, they were penalized. So 
I thought that maybe we should come up with some solution which will provide a, a way so that they can contribute towards um, uh, training the machine learning model to identify and classify these new lineages as well. So these privacy concern, concerns I wanted to address in this work and that was the main motivation behind it. So moving forward, uh, so federated, data, federated learning based solution will tackle the issue of data privacy since we are not uh, sending and we the countries need not to explicitly say that we have found a new variant or a new lineage they can just train it to the model and the model weights will be transmitted that way the uh, useful knowledge and useful information will be extracted in the form of a model weights and can be used by the other countries as a local model so uh, our approach is uh, we are using a separate feed forward neural network at the local level and at the global level as, as well so we are uh, aggregating the models weight from the local at the uh, local and transmit these weights to the global server model where these weights are aggregated and the global model is uh, adapting the knowledge from the local ones so uh, this is the architecture first given input data we have a uh, genomic sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 genome uh, so we convert that sequence uh, amino assets into one hot encoding and the main architecture uh, backbone is composed of two components the first one is the local models uh, which is individual to each country and then we have a one global centralized model so the idea is to distribute the computational load as well as keep the information of the local client which uh, we are assuming as a one nation in here a country can keep our local data within their premises and have a local model where we are they, they are training their data uh, they are using their data to train the local model and then the global model uh, is the centralized model where it aggregates all the weights coming from the local model so we train multiple local models um, in our case we use the data with nine different countries so we have nine different models and then we aggregate the uh, weights which are learned uh, which are being uh, pushed from the, these, these local models to global after learning from the local data so this is the workflow uh, as we can see like uh, what i have said that first we convert the sequence into the one hot encoding on uh, the B figure you can see and then on C figure we have uh, just it's a prototype so we had to segregate it but I, in ideal situation this will be the initial setup that we get already so each country will have their own data sets of their sequences and uh, some of the data we are assuming is being pushed because not 100% data can be kept private so they, I'm, I'm assuming like some of the data will be pushed towards global model for training as well so uh, on figure f you can see we are splitting with the 30 70 percent data uh, so to keep the testing for the global model and the rest all is being forward for the local training and global training so on uh, figure f you can see we are splitting again 30 70 percent to train the global model and train the local model so we are training the global and local separately and we kept 30 percent earlier for testing aside and finally we train the uh, local models and push the weights um, as you can see on the i figure weight aggregation is happening uh, there we are having three different aggregation techniques that we are comparing it's average um, we're taking the max weight and the min weight and likewise uh, all three methods of aggregation is being compared and studied in uh, this study and um, the data that was kept aside for the global training is now used after aggregation after initializing with the aggregated weights uh, we are training considering that the global data is also available for the global model uh, so that we get some more tuning at the global level and then finally we do the prediction uh, so when we talk about what actually it is it is the whole problem is optimizing and uh, reducing the loss at the global level so if you see um, on this equation uh, k is the number of clients and we're trying to reduce the loss um, aggregated after each local client is being uh, trained uh, locally and pushed at the global level 
So I'm gonna skip these, but yeah, the, we are using the split of 70-30%. Uh, first round for testing, and then another 70-30% for training local and global respectively. And we use the three different aggregation strategies. So the data set that we have used is the uh, spike sequence data. Uh, as we know, like the SARS-CoV-2 has a genome of 30 kb, but the spike is the only region which is responsible for uh, mutation. So we just kept the spike sequences uh, for the ex experimentation purpose and we used it from the well-known ESA data set. And we have a 22 different lineages, so 22 different coronavirus variants spread across like these nine countries, um, US, England, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Japan, and these were the stats for these data sets. Uh, the distribution for lineage wise, this is the distribution for B117 we have 3400 lineages and likewise um, these are the distribution for the classes that we are trying to classify for. The baseline models that we used uh, is like the other deep learning methods that we wanted to test on. So we used the LSTM, GRU, CNN, uh, we used the centralized feed forward neural network in the centralized setting as well. Um, we wanted to test on the embedding based methods as well, so we did the point care uh, embeddings and autoencoder also. And the metrics that we used for uh, quantifying the classification results that we have got uh, are F1 and accuracies and loss. So these are the results that we have got uh, for the feature engineering uh, method based point care uh, embedding we have used uh, so we have a classifier like SVM, uh, Nightblaze and MLP and the other ones but you can see like uh, in feature engineering based embedding methods we are not getting like even a comparable accuracy at all. Uh, when we come to the centralized neural network, uh, centralized based uh, baseline methods, the LSTM, GRU and CNN also performs very poor. But the feed forward neural network you can see in a centralized setting gives like around 62% of accuracy. Which is okay, but uh, just make a note here that we need to push all the data in the central server. It involves the cost of transmitting data and no privacy is being preserved in here. That's the most important thing. Uh, whereas when we perform the experiment on our proposed approach like the federated learning based solution when aggregating from local to global, um, the min and max didn't perform that well. You can see 49% or 50% accuracy around, but Fed uh, average, like when we take the average rate around, it's around 63%, which is definitely more than that, but marginally. But uh, the point to be noted in here is like we are not pushing any data to the central server and uh, we are keeping the whole data privacy which is the main concept of this paper to motivate the countries to reveal their data through the model training rather than just pushing the whole sequence and um, declaring it publicly with a human readable sense so here it's like all abstract from country which variant it is evolving you're not getting anything so these are the results uh, plots that we have got and this is very interesting. So if you can see the black line is representing the global model. So on the right side, you can see the global loss, which is um, getting converged. And on the left, left side, you can see the global average accuracy is in between around 60%. But all other local models, which are in different colors, are performing very well, which is quite obvious because that's the concept of federated learning. When you have a local data, you want your local model to learn the local data much more better, and the global model will um, average it out and bring it lower. Um, but the point is, the global model is learning from these local models in a way to overall increase the performance for a new variants when whenever it sees that these are coming. So this is expected behavior and it was an interesting result uh, that what we have presented. So to conclude, um, we demonstrated with our experiments that federated learning based approach can be used for uh, genomic surveillance where the data privacy is the major concern being in healthcare uh, to tackle the pandemics um, or pandemic like situation for any uh, genomic 
uh, sequencing data set, we can definitely adapt the predictive learning based solution. In future, uh, we are trying to uh, adapt it for or like run the experiments on a bigger and larger data sets uh, with more diverse, like rabies viruses there, that's what we are doing currently. And we wanted to experiment more on other deep learning, well-known uh, new emerging models like RMs being proposed by other authors lately. So we, we, we've been keeping an eye on it that what are the new uh, methods that are coming. So we planning on implementing those and see that how it is coming. And the most important thing that we are going to work on is uh, the fairness also because right now we are not considering any fairness. If any country is giving uh, less data or producing less data, then also we are just aggregating and averaging it out. So we want to give some factor of a cost that if it is coming from a larger country, if it is a larger data set, then there should be a penalty uh, for the smaller data set, there should be a penalty on the model. So we want to incorporate those uh, cost for um, the kind of data that is coming on. So I think that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Have a question. Thank you very much, Patal, for this uh, nice presentation. Um, I have a very small question. Um, so, you evaluated your model using 30-70% data subject, I think, right? Yes. Um, so, I'm guessing what will happen if there is a new variant. So, have you evaluated your model uh, using leave one? Variant out or having a another class like unknown class or something like that. Uh, so we have not done yet, but you know, that's a good question. That if a new variant is evolving, uh, so the idea is like because the local model will learn it, and the, in the terms of way, it will be pushed further into the global model. So we are expecting that the global model will be not performing like outrightly very efficiently, but at least better than knowing nothing. It has some information to classify that local, um, that variant and it is capable of finding the new variants evolving cluster. So that's uh, one of the other application for finding the bubbles if you are having in a timely fashion. I'm already working on that paper that we are trying to segregate the timely based data and see if uh, the data has not been evolved in the at certain point of 10 t and t plus 1 data comes to the global model and what will happen. Uh, we are working on that project already. Thank you. No, any more questions? Thank you for the talk. First of all, it was a really nice talk. And uh, just a little question is that I've noticed you use different strategies for the aggregation process, right? Yeah, uh, so I just wonder if you use like the average for the whole different local data sets and then the minimum and then the maximum. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what we did. So we took the aggregation and then we took the minimum weights and maximum weights and then took the average weights. So these are the three ones. Yeah, just have a little thought on the aggregation process because you have nine different data sets from different countries, right? Yes. If it is possible that you could just do like a clustering method to just a cluster similar, you know, similar data sets into the same cluster to downsize down your, you know, your data set and you do maybe choose different aggregation strategies on each cluster, if that could give you more accuracy increasing on your final results. I don't know, just a simple you know, suggestion for that. Maybe it could be explored in the future, I guess. Yeah, that's a nice thought. I believe it could do some good because the clustering will give you the distance between the sequences. But right now, uh, it didn't come into my mind because probably uh, it's not a big deal if you classify 12 classes or 22 classes. The clustering is going to give you another class. But yeah, that's a nice experimentation. We should definitely go on for that one. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Oh, great suggestion. Thank you. Um, any more questions? 
Um, I just had a quick sort of uh, federated learning sort of question. Um, so the local models and the global models, are they perfect copies of each other? And yeah? Yeah, we, we kept the same model, exactly the same model to forward neural network. Okay. Yeah. And is, is it possible though, like in some other setting, to have different models? Like how would that aggregation work like? Yeah, that's a step process, so I'm looking forward to work on that and it's a multimodal data that you can get. Yeah. Uh, in that case, the model will be different and then we have to come up with a different strategy. So this was just a prototype kind of thing that we wanted to implement, that's why we used the 7K data. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like 10 million of sequences data available on the inside. But yeah, I'm looking forward to work on that area definitely for the multimodal uh, data set to have different kind of models and have aggregation at the end. Okay, so that is possible? That is possible, okay. definitely. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Prakash. I really appreciate your talk. Um, another round of applause, please, for everyone, all the authors. So that is the end of the session. So thanks everyone for coming and for your excellent questions. Um, I believe lunch will probably, oh, I don't think there's lunch today actually, but um, yeah, we're ahead of schedule, so you've got a couple extra minutes to, to do some sightseeing, I suppose. Um, all right, thanks everyone.